In the modern world, we are constantly bombarded with notifications. Everyone has a ticket that never expires to contact us at any moment and a constant window into our life. This is both a good and a bad thing. On one hand, it allows us to always stay informed with those close to us, but the dark side is that it can overload our ability to communicate with others by pulling our thoughts in too many different directions. Dunbar's number is said to represent the maximum number of relationships we can maintain at any given time. Now 150 people may seem pretty small when you compare it to all the Facebook friends you may have, or all the Instagram followers your account has accumulated. But consider what it would be like sitting at a table eating dinner with 150 people that you know the best. So the question that must be asked is if we can't properly maintain more than 150 relationships in real life, why would we be able to online? On Snapchat, every consecutive day you send snaps back and forth with someone you add a number to your streak. And if you don't send someone to Snapchat for 24 hours, the number resets to zero. This causes many teens to obsess over maintaining these numbers with many people at once. One team was said to be attempting to maintain 173 Snapchat streaks every day for three years straight. This feature keeps people looking at their phones, which repeatedly fragments thoughts and concentration, just like many other features developed for social media apps that some of the original developers openly state were designed to be addictive. The thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them to really understand it. That thought process was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. So we want to psychologically figure out how to manipulate you as fast as possible and then give you back that dopamine hit. We did that at, brilliantly at Facebook. Instagram has done it, WhatsApp has done it. You know, Snapchat has done it, Twitter has done it. You're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. It literally changes your relationship with society, with each other. God only knows what it's doing to, to our children's brains. We curate our lives around this perceived sense of perfection because we get rewarded in these short-term signals, hearts, likes, thumbs up, and we conflate that with value and we conflate it with truth. It literally is a point now where I think we have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. No civil discourse, no cooperation, misinformation, mistruth. And it's not an American problem. This is not about Russian ads. This is a global problem. Your behaviors, you don't realize it, but you are being programmed. When we analyze how Americans spend their time on a typical day, we can see that 8 hours are devoted to sleep. That leaves 16 hours for other tasks. If it's a weekday and you work a 9 to 5, you are left with 8 hours of free time. In 2016, US adults spent an average of 5 hours per day on cell phones. So think about it, on a normal work day, this is over half of your free time after sleep and work. And the data shows that only 4% of this time on smartphones is spent on productivity. The majority of it is frittered away on social media apps. With all the attention consumed by smartphones and the resulting fragmentation caused to people's focus, it can make it hard to digest other things. You may be focused on your phone while at a restaurant with friends or checking texts while you spend the day outdoors. But I believe that the biggest problem that this fragmentation causes is that it leaves a smaller amount of attention to be at your disposal to digest the bigger issues of the world. The world is a complicated place, and developing an understanding of how it functions is extremely important to achieving peace of mind and worldly success. If we combine the absurd amount of time spent on smartphones and the resulting fragmentation of attention to other topics, a picture starts to be painted of how people may become less informed about the news. Many have a hard time making decisions in daily life, and it's no different when you're on a smartphone. Think of the term clickbait. Our attention is pulled in by sensational sounding headlines rather than getting a broad dose of everything that is going on in enough detail to be fairly informed on the intricacies of each topic, like we might have been when reading a traditional newspaper, which offers the reader a broad overview of all the important current events while giving a fairly detailed account of each one. Regarding traditional newspapers, between 2010 and 2018, traditional newspaper reading time per capita has been cut in half in the US, from 25 to 12 minutes, and the circulation of traditional newspapers has been cut in half since 2003 with 70% of this decrease happening since 2007, the same year the original iPhone was released. Another way that the flow of news people get is becoming skewed is through getting locked into an echo room due to social media algorithms. How an algorithm works is that over time, due to the content you view, the program conforms to your likes and dislikes and then recommends content in the future that pertains to these same things. So you can see how this could be especially problematic in terms of the political content people end up seeing on their phone. 
Some people may claim that this is not an issue as people have the power to look up any information they want from any political standpoint. But if you were getting algorithmically spoon-fed the political angle you want to hear, why would you be delving deeper? Overall, these issues lead to people not being sufficiently informed about current events and as a result retreat to either corner of the political arena. I personally believe that there are solutions that could be accepted by both Democrats and Republicans. And to exemplify this, I'm going to take one of the most pressing issues in today's current political climate and give a feasible middle ground that I feel both sides should be able to accept. Republicans, my question to you is do you believe in taking responsibility for your and by extension your country's actions? I hear many Republicans talk of deporting immigrants as if it is a good thing, but think about the actual ramifications of what you are preaching. You are suggesting that when we catch people who have been in this country for sometimes years, that we should take them and their whole family back to their home country on the spot. Imagine this in practice. The breadwinner of a family gets pulled over for speeding, and within 24 hours the family's home has been barged into by police officers. They take their three kids who know nothing but the U.S. into custody, deporting them to their origin country where they have no recollection of ever living before. I personally do not find this a pleasant picture to imagine, and I I assume that many reasonable people would agree with me. Put yourself in these people's shoes. However, there's another side of this coin, and if you want to be informed, you need to understand where both sides of the argument are coming from. Democrats, imagine that one of your children is out jogging in the evening to train for cross-country practice and gets attacked by an illegal immigrant. They get seriously injured and are no longer the same person again, either physically disabled and permanently bedridden, their athletic career in ruins, or worse, they are mentally impaired from the assault, being spoon-fed three times a day by a nurse and can no longer put together a sentence. They look at you not knowing who you are and never will again. The person that attacked them was an individual wanted for domestic abuse in their home country and snuck across the U.S. border in order to evade authorities, going ghost from their home country and living anonymously in the U.S. So what is the compromise? My proposition is that we allow people that are here illegally to stay here. However, the conditions for this are important. First, the U.S. government spends time to develop a temporary infrastructure of tents throughout the country. These should be within one mile of everyone's home in order to accommodate walking. These tents are makeshift immigration centers. The people that come to them are able to, within two hours, get a background check and instantly be granted full citizenship into the United States of America along with all the opportunities that come with it. Opponents of this might ask, but what about the people that have committed crimes? I propose that for all small crimes, a monetary fine is issued in the form of something like a parking ticket to the new U.S. citizen. If someone that has committed a more serious crime, for example, murder, rape, or domestic abuse, actually walked into one of these tents and this came up in a background check, then they could either be made a U.S. citizen, put in jail, and sent through the normal trial process, or be deported. But likely, these people would simply not come to the immigration station in the first place because they know they committed a crime and they don't want to face the repercussions. But what if someone has committed a more serious crime but passes the background check and is now a U.S. citizen with benefits? Well, at least now, if evidence of this person's crime comes about, they are in the system and we know this person is in our country. Now, they could be potentially arrested as we know their home address if information about them comes to light. These tents would open across the country on the same day and be available to everybody for a set period of time, let's say two months before being closed and normal immigration laws were put back into place and enforced. Now, this is a compromise between both sides, so in order to correct our mistakes of leaving the border open in the first place, we build the wall. But this could involve a compromise that allows more lenient legal immigration laws and an easier process to immigrate to the United States. Now if you see where I'm coming from but are skeptical about the economic cost, some relevant numbers are that the border wall cost is said to be between 12 and 70 billion, depending on if you listen to Trump or Senate Democrats respectively. One number to compare this to is the yearly U.S. military spending, which last year totaled 874 billion. So if paid in one year, this wall would cost, using the Democrats number, one twelfth of the U.S. 2018 military spending. The point of this film is not actually to solve any issues or argue for either side. It is to show that there are actual middle grounds even to some of the most pressing issues today, but these areas of compromise so often get overshadowed by the swamp of partisan reporting on both sides. I've always been proud to be an American, and it saddens me to see my home country's political discourse result in so much distaste for the opposing side. Our political system should work to make compromises between parties and move along peacefully as a united sovereign nation of people that all have a common respect and love for one another. But we have to make an effort in the United States. We have to make an effort to understand, to get beyond or go beyond these rather difficult times. My favorite poem, my, my favorite poet was Aeschylus. He once wrote, Even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own day despair, against our will, comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. What we need in the United States is not division, 
What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another.